we find that Jesus' teachings do not justify wrongdoings. Remember he said, whatever you'd have others do to you, do also to them and love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus' teachings do not justify wrongdoings, but interestingly, Darwin's actually can. Today we are looking at one of my very favorite topics. We are looking today at how to think about facts that challenge your faith, a super practical and relevant topic for us today in our information age, when we're bombarded all the time by all kinds of messages that are presented as if they're facts, when they may or may not be true. So we need to be able to think through these types of messages, because sometimes even when messages that go against God's word, which we know must be false, they can still sound persuasive because we hear them all the time. So how do we answer these types of questions? Well, that's part of the field of study and practice we call apologetics, which is the logical defense of the Christian faith, not apologizing for anything, but defending why we believe what we believe. And this concept comes straight from the Bible. First Peter talks about, in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense or give an answer to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that you have, but do it with gentleness and respect. And you don't see the word apologetics in that verse, but you do see the word defense, which comes from a Greek word, apologia. You can hear the similarity. It's where we get the word apologetics from. And this word means to defend your position like you would in a legal court of law. So apologetics is about defending the position of the gospel and being able to answer questions. How do we know the Bible's true? What about evolution and Genesis? How do those things, uh, how do we know that the Bible does not contradict the scientific world and the world we see around us? So as a quick confession, I didn't used to care about any of those topics like apologetics when I was a teenager. Instead, I cared about other things I knew were important, uh, things like doing justice, you know, sharing, um, sharing food with other people, helping the hungry, helping those in poverty, uh, doing global outreach around the world, equipping the church for the future in different places. I knew those things were important. But then there were other things like Genesis and fossils and creation and evolution that I didn't really get were relevant for the rest of my faith. I didn't think they mattered that much. But then something happened when I was 14, and I heard this speaker, Ken Ham, the founder of Answers in Genesis, and he connected the dots for me by explaining how all those things I knew were important depended on the truth of God's word beginning in Genesis. So that's when I realized that anything that undermines Genesis undermines everything I knew to be important. So I decided, obviously, I have to become an apologetic speaker like Ken Ham someday to help defend Genesis against these cultural attacks. And because evolution is one of culture's favorite frameworks for attacking Genesis, I decided to learn about evolution in depth. So I got my science degree, studying biology and psychology at a secular university in my home country, Canada. And while I was there, I had to learn how to navigate hearing all kinds of messages that challenged my faith. So I learned what helped me in that setting, but I wanted to know what helped other Christian students in other countries keep their faith in response to these questions as well. So I got this wild idea to see if I could backpack the whole way around the planet in six months interviewing Christian students about how they keep their faith at university. So I went to about 17 countries, including Canada, and everywhere I went I asked four questions. And looking at these will help us see why this topic today is so important. So the questions I asked were, first of all, what are the challenges of being a Christian student here? What are the opportunities? What's your advice for a first-year Christian student? And how can churches support students better? So as I traveled, I began to see this pattern where people answered the first two questions differently. You'd expect that. It makes sense for people to experience different challenges in different places. But what was really interesting is people answered the last two questions very similarly, no matter where I went. So that's exciting because it means that while the problems Christian students face in different contexts looks different, the solutions they use to overcome those problems looks very similar wherever you go. So that means that if churches and families and ministries can focus on just some practical strategic solutions for equipping the next generation, that can make a difference for the future of the church literally around the world. And I found it comes down to helping young people build three types of personal foundations. And these aren't just for young people to get through university, by the way. These are all very biblical concepts. If you look at stories from the persecuted church and stories of world-changing Christians throughout church history, you'll find they often excelled in these foundations as well. 
So these don't just apply to helping Christian students get through university. They apply to helping any Christian keep a strong biblical worldview and live that worldview out even in hard settings and to do that in a way that impacts their surroundings through Jesus. So let's take a look at these briefly. First of all was the importance of spiritual foundations. Having your own close personal walk with God, owning your own faith, knowing what the Bible says, making that the basis for your thinking. Second was the importance of intellectual foundations, having apologetics knowledge like what we talked about, as well as biblical critical thinking skills to think through new messages that come up. And finally was the importance of interpersonal foundations. So that's your Christian community support networks, including family and biblical local church and godly older adult mentors, which was super important. So there are great resources you can find from our ministry and different ministries to help you build these foundations. But I find that throughout broader church circles, one of these areas that's especially not talked about so much is specifically the critical thinking side of those intellectual foundations. So that is what we are going to look at today as we explore this topic of how to think about facts, quote, quote, that challenge your faith. So to show you what I mean by that, I'm going to do a little bit of a role play, change characters right now, and give you an example of the types of messages that I was taught that went against my biblical beliefs in university. So putting on my fake professor glasses here. Hello everyone, welcome to university. I'm your instructor, Dr. Frizzle Swizzen, and I'm so excited for our class together, Elements of Critical Thinking, Philosophy 121. So you can find our class syllabus online. It outlines our course expectations, assignment details, and exam dates. You'll want to pay attention to those. Our textbook is Vaughn and McDonald, The Power of Critical Thinking. Please read the introduction in chapter one by next lecture. Meanwhile, what is critical thinking? Well, it just means evaluating a message to see if it's worth believing. So why is that important? Why are you taking this class? Well, critical thinking is vital because every day we encounter all kinds of persuasive messages, statements, advertisements, opinions, and arguments that attempt to alter our thinking, to sway our beliefs, and to compel us to make certain decisions, to buy certain products, and even to adopt certain religious perspectives. As you'll learn in anthropology and sociology, religion probably evolved as a means to help people cope with agricultural uncertainties, or explain the unexplainable, or control vast populations, and of course to justify political agendas, and various atrocities. Even today, right-wing fundamentalists seek to promote pseudoscientific religious ideas like creationism in public sectors like schools. And your textbook explains why we need to think critically about creationists' agendas. To quote from chapter 10 of your book, creationism has zero scope. On every count, it shows itself to be inferior. Scientists are then justified in rejecting creationism in favor of evolution, and this is exactly what they do. Well, that was my textbook, and that gives you an idea of the types of messages that students might encounter, and the types of messages that any of us might encounter in culture, and sometimes even church circles, we hear things that go against the Bible. So maybe you haven't needed to take classes like that or be in that type of environment, but that's okay, because no matter what you do and no matter where you're at, you're pretty much guaranteed at some point to encounter persuasive messages that go against your biblical beliefs. And no matter how many apologies answers you learn ahead of time to defend those beliefs, you're always bound to have new questions because there will always be new information. And then what do you do? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today, so that whenever you're in a class where, say, a professor declares something like, intelligent design is a whacked out tea party movement, I heard a professor say that, or maybe you're scrolling social media and you see a headline that says, new discovery proves how life could have evolved spontaneously, or maybe you're sharing your faith with a friend who says, yeah, but Christians have done so many horrible things in the past, why should I believe the Bible? Or maybe you're sitting in church where a pastor says something like, well, Jesus said the kingdom of God is within you, so we all have divinity within ourselves, we're all God if we just learn to recognize it. Well, these types of messages and false teachings are a lot more common than you might expect because false teachers are 
everywhere, and they're only going to get worse. Remember what Paul t- said to Timothy. He said, evil people and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you've learned it, and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation. So in this world of deception, what are some practical tips to help us hold on to those things that we have learned and firmly believed? Well, that's where three rules of critical thinking come in, which we're going to look at today. Number one, don't panic when you hear a message that challenges your faith. Instead, rule two, break that message down and think critically about its pieces. And finally, rule three is following up on any remaining questions you have. So as a fair warning, we are going to blitz through a ton of information in a pretty tight time together. Might feel a little bit like drinking from a water hose, but, or a fire hose, but you don't have to worry about trying to remember all of this or write it all down. It's already written down for you in a resource uh, that I wrote, a book called Prepare to Thrive, a Survival Guide for Christian Students. So again, all this information is in there, so you can just sit back, relax, and we'll go through these rules, spending most of our time in Rule 2, where we'll look at a a toolkit called Seven Checks of Critical Thinking that you can start using right now to break down any new message you encounter and use that to learn how to think like an apologist yourself. All right, so if that sounds like a plan, let's dive in today with rule one, don't panic. Now, that might sound obvious, but if you're a student like I was sitting in a class where a professor makes some sort of argument against the Bible you've never heard before, or maybe you're sharing your faith with a friend who raises an objection to Christianity that you don't know how to answer, you might start to notice your heart beating a little faster. And you might begin to wonder, what if I'm wrong about my biblical beliefs? But that's the time to take a deep breath and remember what you know. We know God's word is true. God's word provides the foundation for truth to exist and be knowable in the first place because it reminds us that we have a creator whose character is the source of absolute truth. He created a logical universe that confirms his word. And since we know God's word is true, we know anything that contradicts the Bible must be a lie. And on some level, all lies have to fall apart. Like Romans 3, 4 says, let God be true, though everyone were a liar. So God's word is our measuring stick and our final authority for truth. And truth fears no questions. Since the Bible is true, it can handle any question you have for it. It will always stand up to scrutiny. And there are a couple of tips I like to give students, and other young people especially, to help them not panic in the meantime. So if you are a student, or know a student, or are raising a student, or will be a student, these might be handy. Number one, put faith-challenging information in quotation marks when you're taking notes in class. That frees you from feeling like you're writing down a definite fact because you're just noting what someone happens to be saying. Interestingly, even the chief priests at Jesus' trial knew the power of quotation marks, didn't they? Because remember, when Pilate was writing the sign for the cross, it said, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. But the priests were like, come on, Pilate, put it in quotes. Don't write the king of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am the king of the Jews. So you see what's going on there, right? One sign says, this is a fact. The other sign says, well, this is just what someone thinks about himself. So quotes make a big difference, and I encourage you to keep using them in your notes, even if you get tired after four years of university doing so. All right, so that is tip number one. And another one is to write down questions you have as you encounter faith-challenging messages. Having that record of what your questions are will help you go back and follow up on them later when you have a chance. Otherwise, you might start to feel like there's all this vague evidence accumulating against your beliefs, even if you can't remember what your questions and doubts were so that you can follow up on them later. All right, so that's rule one. When you hear a message that challenges your faith, Don't panic. Instead, remember truth fears no questions. Put it in quotes and write down any questions you have about it. All right, so cruising right along here, let's move on to rule two, how to break that message down by thinking critically about its pieces and separating everything that's fact and logic from everything that's not. And again, there's that tool to help you do that called the seven checks of critical thinking. 
And that begins, first of all, with checking scripture. We can always detect a lie by comparing it to something we know is true. Since God's word is our ultimate authority for truth, it makes sense to compare new messages against the word of our all-knowing, infallible, inerrant creator as the first check to see if it's true or false. And we also want to ask, how does the Bible speak to the subject that this message is about? Because that will give us a true foundation for thinking through that topic. So these are just some of the reasons why it's so important for us as Christians to be consistently filling ourselves up with God's word so that we can be like those Berean Jews in Acts 17 who examine the scriptures every day to see if what they heard was true. But we can't anticipate that Satan will make us try to second guess what God has said. Just like back in Eden where he was like, well, did God really say you shouldn't eat that? And today we might be tempted to think, well, did God really say he created everything in six days or there was really a global flood or Jesus is really the only way to God? Yes, he did say that. And his word is what needs to be the foundation for our thinking about everything. And that means not only comparing everything we hear against scripture, but also everything we tell ourselves, our own thoughts. Second Corinthians talks about taking thoughts captive to obey Christ. So I especially like to encourage other young people that taking thoughts captive by comparing them against scripture will save you so much trouble in the future, helping you guard your mind from falling into unhealthy thinking patterns and helping you guard your heart, which can save you tons of grief if you grasp that at a young age. All right, so we wanna compare messages we hear against scripture, messages we tell ourselves against scripture, that's check one. So the next step is that you can zoom in a little bit and check the challenge. What about your faith is this message actually contradicting? Because sometimes as we compare a message against God's word, we realize it doesn't challenge our faith and what the Bible says so much as maybe human made ideas from outside the Bible that we might have been incorporating into our beliefs. Uh, maybe personal opinions about church traditions or some sort of non-doctrinal side issue like the question of how many wise men visited Jesus, right? The Bible doesn't actually tell us so we don't have to freak out if someone says it wasn't three like you see in all the nativity scenes. But that's very different from a doctrinal foundations issue like the question of whether Adam existed. Jesus died on account of Adam's sin so this is a foundations issue. And there are three questions that can help you tell the difference. First of all, does this message conflict with a clear teaching from scripture? Does it conflict with the big picture of what the Bible teaches? And does it conflict with the way most Christians have historically interpreted the Bible for thousands of years? In other words, orthodoxy. So of course, if you answered yes to these, you're dealing with something that directly challenges the Bible. You know it's gonna fall apart. And meanwhile, you can continue thinking critically about it by moving on to check three. And that is check the source. So who's telling you this message? What's their credibility? How trustworthy are they? The most credible human source, of course, is an expert about the message's topic. So a message about microbiology will be a lot more credible coming from an expert microbiologist than even from someone who's an expert in another field like chemistry or, of course, from some random dude on the internet. But something to remember is that even experts can make mistakes, can believe wrong ideas, and are biased by the worldviews they start with. So we want to keep the source's worldview in mind as well. As a quick reminder, a worldview is just that set of beliefs we use to explain the world around us like a pair of glasses. So are we looking at everything and interpreting everything through the glasses of God's word as a starting point for our thinking or the glasses of man's word? Because those lenses will help determine the assumptions we use and the conclusions we wind up with, and that will be important to remember in just a little bit. Meanwhile, we also might want to consider the source's motives. People say and do things for a lot of different reasons, and sometimes those aren't obvious. So news websites, for instance, tend to publish information that they know will keep their readers and advertisers engaged. So what gets published and how it's worded, as we know, can be very financially and politically motivated. Now that doesn't necessarily mean it's false, but it could mean that you're not getting an accurate representation of the whole truth, so it's just something to keep in mind. So while you're checking the source, you'll also probably want to ask, how is this information collected? Because studies, for example, can be misled by all kinds of experimental problems, whether that's biased survey questions or small sample sizes or faulty starting assumptions. And then articles about what studies show don't always tell you important details like how many people were involved or other things that can affect how we should view the study's results. 
And headlines can also draw sensational conclusions beyond what the researchers actually said. So it's worth going back to the original study, if you can find it, to ask how is this information collected and is it even being reported accurately? All right, so that's step three, check the source. So now we're at a really important one, and that's checking definitions. We always want to define terms because not only can words mean different things to different people or in different contexts, but as we're seeing a lot lately, culture changes their meanings over time. So we want to ask, how is this word being used? The word evolution, for instance. I took entire classes about evolution, and when my textbooks gave examples of evolution we can see happening, it was always evolution in a sense of what we, from a biblical perspective, would recognize as variation within kinds of living things God created, like finches or tanager birds. So in my classes, we talked about how things like mutation and natural selection can let finches with long beaks give rise to groups of finches with short beaks as natural selection removes the genetic information for the other beak variants from the population. And that's cool. That actually supports a biblical model of how we get diversity within kinds of living things, but it's certainly not an example of evolution evolution in the sense of change between kinds, like dinosaurs evolving into finches, which would somehow require adding new genetic variants and new information for new body parts like feathers and wings that was not there before. So these are totally different. We don't see that second type of evolution actually happening in the real world. It goes against what we do observe from biology and genetics, as you can learn about in some of our other resources, like the Answers books. And yet, textbooks will tell you that these are equal. They'll say, well, we can see finches evolving into finches. Therefore, we know dinosaurs evolved into finches. But hang on, if you notice what happened there, the definition and meaning of evolution switched, right? So if you notice the word shift meaning during a discussion, you've detected a fallacy, a kind of flawed logic called bait and switch or equivocation. But you can watch out for that by always defining terms. All right, so now we are at my very favorite step to talk about, and that is watching for propaganda. As a quick reminder, propaganda is just a type of communication that tries to persuade by appealing to something other than logic or potentially by misusing facts. So this poster, for instance, is trying to persuade you to give money to the Nazis. Why? Well, because an adorable little girl is asking you to and there's lots of sunshine and flowers in the background. But that's not an appeal to logic, it's an appeal to emotion. And we can use propaganda to argue for apparently good causes too, like resisting the Nazis. So this poster is trying to persuade you to buy victory bonds by appealing to your emotion of fear. And that image of the monster hands reaching for the child also creates this negative association in your mind so that you're linking the enemy to something monstrous. On the other hand, commercials often try to make positive associations, don't they? They'll show you happy pictures of happy people drinking beverages in happy places with happy music in the background, so you link those beverages to happy things and want to spend money on them too. On the other hand, messages and culture sometimes link Christianity and the Bible to negative things like child abuse. They'll say that teaching kids the Bible is on par with locking kids in basements. But notice, that is not a logical, facts-based argument against the truth of the Bible's content. It's just propaganda. So is labeling, name-calling, saying that people who believe the Bible are losers or haters or bigots. That's also not a logical, facts-based argument against the truth of the Bible's content. It's just propaganda. And some other common types of propaganda rely on some really powerful psychological forces, one of which is authority. So that's when a message sounds true because the source looks authoritative. But um, we have to remember that it's not necessarily the case that that is true. And some pretty scary research has actually shown that when someone who looks authoritative and educated tells people to do or believe something, even if they don't want to, it can be really hard not to. Another powerful force is conformity. So as humans, we're socially wired creatures, right? We want to follow other people and be like other people and be accepted and liked. That's literally what drives social media. So studies, again, have found that um, adults will give a wrong answer to an easy question a third of the time just so that they can be like everyone else in the room. And Advertisers know that this is super powerful, so they appeal to this, and that is called the bandwagon effect. You know, everybody's doing this or buying this or believing this, therefore you should too. But again, just propaganda. Another powerful psychological force 
is repetition. So that's when messages sound true just because we hear them over and over. Studies have found that even when students know a message is true, if they see it repeated a few times, they start to answer questions, or sorry, if they know a message is false, if they see it repeated a few times, they start to answer questions as if they think it's true. And this is so common, psychologists actually have a name for it, the illusionary truth effect. When we see it a lot, so we just think, well, obviously it must be a fact. All right, so these are all common types of propaganda. And a lot of these types of propaganda-based arguments tend to rely on a couple of fallacies, a whole category of flawed logic called fallacies of irrelevant premises. And it turns out there's a long, long list of these fallacies. They have some kind of strange Latin names. But the good news is, is you don't have to go out and try to memorize what all of these fallacies are and keep all their names straight, because there is one critical thinking hack that you can use to recognize and respond to any of them without even having to know what they're called. Instead, all you have to do is ask one question. Is this message true or false because? For example, practice time. Is a message true because many people seem to think so? Well, no, that goes back to that bandwagon effect we talked about. History and psychology and the Bible remind us that large groups of people can be, and actually often are, wrong at the same time. So this is a type of fallacy called appeal to popularity, or ad populum, if you want to be Latin about it. The number of people who believe something is actually irrelevant to whether it's true. All right, well, is a message true because people who disagree with it are ridiculed? Well, no, that goes back to that uh, propaganda technique of labeling. And this is called the ad hominem fallacy, which means to the man. But no matter how many times you insult a messenger, that can't change whether the message is true. All right, well, maybe is a message true because someone smart or wealthy or famous said so? Again, no, right? So these are all types of genetic fallacies, which say that a message is true or false based only on the kind of person saying it, when that's not necessarily the case. Another genetic fallacy would be saying that a message is false because people who believe it are acting hypocritically. For instance, I could be standing up here eating a pure bag of sugar, pausing only to wave my spoon at other people and say, you know, you should never eat a lot of sugar. It's really bad for your health. So you could point out, um, excuse me, you're literally eating a huge bag of sugar and telling everybody else not to. What's up with that? And it's totally fair to point out my hypocrisy. But here's a question. Would the fact that I'm acting inconsistently with my message actually change whether my message is true? No, sugar is bad for your health, no matter whether I happen to be acting consistently with that reality or not. So it'll make me less credible as a person and, and as a friend to be hypocritical, but it doesn't actually change the truth of the message. And saying otherwise would be a fallacy called tu coque, which means you too. But again, if you noticed, you don't have to go memorize all these Latin names to recognize these fallacies. Sort of like how if you're weeding a garden, you don't need to go memorize all the Latin species names of the weeds to recognize that they're not the flowers as you want. Same thing with logic. We just have to ask, is this true or false because? It's simple and it comes across as a lot more gentle in conversation than accusing people of bad logic in Latin. All right. Well, here's another one. Is a message true because God's word says so? Well, yes, it is, absolutely. Uh, God's word is our authority for truth. He does not make mistakes. So it is not a genetic fallacy to say that a message is true because it comes from our all-knowing creator, because he is not a fallible human being. He is not a man that he should lie. And yet people, they'll try to tell you that it's a genetic fallacy. You just believe it because it came from a certain book. But again, you don't have to worry about that being the case. We can trust God's word 100%. All right, well, how about this very last example? Is a message false because people who think so have done bad things? No, and yet this is one of the most common uh, objections to Christianity that I've heard. And students I've talked to around the world will say that they've heard this type of objection in their classes where professors list different um, political groups who have done evil things and chalk those actions up to religion. So because these objections are so common, we're going to take a little sidebar right now and look at three points you can use to respond to any of them. And you can arrive at these points yourself, by the way, with these seven checks of critical thinking that we're going over today. So point number one, 
The fact that professing Christians can do wrong or misapply scripture is irrelevant to whether it's true. Because remember, it's a genetic fallacy to say that a message is true or false based on the kind of people who believe it. So the fact that professing Christians uh, sometimes try to excuse wrongdoings by twisting the Bible or taking it out of context doesn't actually tell us whether the Bible is true or whether it justifies wrongdoings. To find that out, we have to look at the Bible itself, consider what it teaches holistically, and think about what happens when a biblical worldview is consistently lived out. For Christians, that means looking at Jesus. And when we do that, we find that Jesus' teachings do not justify wrongdoings. Remember he said, whatever you'd have others do to you, do also to them and love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus' teachings do not justify wrongdoings. But interestingly, Darwin's actually can. After all, if humans and their morals are nothing but evolutionary happenstance, why shouldn't we wrong others to advance our own genes' evolutionary success? This type of reasoning has played and even continues to play a role in some of recent history's worst atrocities, as you can learn about in our other resources. But besides all this, if we're even going to talk about right and wrong in the first place, we need some sort of foundation for defining what right and wrong are. We need a moral lawgiver. Moral judgments like wrong require a foundation for morality, and it turns out that without a creator whose character is the source of absolutes, we don't actually have a consistent foundation from which to criticize something as wrong in the first place. So arguments that object to Christianity based on professing Christians' wrongdoings end up having to borrow the biblical concept of morality and the concept of a personal God whose character is the source of truth and who reveals truth through his word in order to argue against the Bible. And arguments that borrow from the same framework they're trying to argue against use a type of self-defeating logic called the stolen concept fallacy. Just a few other examples of concepts that are borrowed from the Bible that you'll often find in different arguments against the Bible include the ideas of truth, logic, knowledge, scientific reasoning, morality, human value, justice, human rights. When we think about it, all these concepts are rooted in Genesis, which teaches us that we have a logical God who created a logical universe and made us humans in his image with inherent dignity and value and faculties for reasoning and being able to observe and know things about our world. And yet these concepts don't end up having an ultimate, consistent, knowable foundation within an evolutionary worldview framework. So the easiest way to spot these types of stolen concepts in arguments is to just ask a big picture question like, hang on, why does this topic matter? For instance, why do we care about wrongdoings in the first place? Well, we care about wronging others because human life matters and morals are real, so um, harming others is morally wrong, it's unjust. But hang on, where do those concepts of morality and val human value and justice come from? From God's word. All right, so we're getting a little ahead of ourselves into a later step of uh, the logical process of, of critical thinking here. But the point for now is just to remember that by bringing arguments back to concepts like what truth is and where truth comes from, we can filter out irrelevant persuasion by propaganda, and we can point people to God's word and to Jesus, who is the truth. All right. So at this point, like I said, you should have been able to filter out the irrelevant persuasion by propaganda, which should leave you with just the facts and their interpretations and the logical or not so logical relationships that people try to draw between those. So that's what you want to check next. And that's important because no matter what our worldview is, both Christians and non-Christians, we all look at the same real world. We see the same plants, same animals, same rock layers and fossils, but we interpret these facts differently based on our different worldview glasses don't we? God's word or man's word. So for example, someone looking at this canyon through the glasses of God's word might say that's great evidence for something happening quickly in a global flood. But someone could look at the exact same canyon through the glasses of man's word and say that's great evidence for something happening slowly over millions of years. And that is an interpretation which will be presented as if it's a fact, like the canyon itself, in mainstream classes and culture. So the question then is, how do we detangle real facts from interpretation? interpretations of facts. And that's where it's really helpful to remember the difference between two types of science. The first is that observational science, which we use to measure and describe 
and describe things we can see in the present. So observational science is how we find cures for diseases and explain animal behavior and develop technology. It's what we could use to identify what kind of dinosaur a fossil is or measure a gun barrel at a crime scene. But just looking at facts in the present doesn't always tell us what happened in the past. How did the dinosaur become a fossil? Who shot the gun? And that is where historical science comes in, which draws conclusions about the past based on facts we can see in the present. And that requires using assumptions and guesses to fill in for gaps in the facts. And those guesses will very often be influenced by our worldview glasses. So that's how the glasses we start with help shape the conclusions we end with, but we can't directly test those conclusions because we can't repeat the past. So by keeping these two types of science in mind when we encounter messages that challenge our faith, we can figure out what parts of the message are fact from observational science and what parts are interpretation from historical science. So for instance, practice time. Let's say you're walking through a museum, not the Creation Museum of course, but a lesser one somewhere, and you see something like this. So what parts of this are fact versus interpretation? Well, the fact is just what we're looking at right now, which is a dinosaur skull. But the interpretation is that it is 65 million years old, right? Skulls don't come out of the ground with convenient little inscriptions saying exactly how old they are. That'd be super convenient, I'd love that. But instead, this is an interpretation based on assumptions about things going on in the rock around the fossils. Those assumptions actually require you to start with long age beliefs in the first place. You can learn about the problems with them in some of our other resources like the Answers books. But meanwhile, we can take these steps we just used and apply them to separate fact from interpretation in any other message you encounter. All we have to do is start by asking, what's the observational science? What parts of this message are observations and raw data that everyone can agree on in the present, and are these measurements accurate? Then we can identify the historical science, asking what parts of this message are assumptions and speculations and educated guesses to fill in for gaps in the facts. And one way to do that is to watch out for flag words like could, might, maybe, probably, possibly. You see these in a lot of evolutionary contexts, and they often, not always, but often, signal that you're dealing with a possible explanation, not a definite fact. It's also worth remembering that there's likely more to the story than what you're hearing. Likely what you're hearing is the most polished presentation of the secular interpretation of a fact, so you want to ask for what is an alternative explanation. How would we look at the very same fact through a biblical pair of glasses? And that also helps you spot another type of fallacy, by the way, called either-or fallacies. Uh, looking for other options will help you spot those, because these fallacies give you only two options to pick from as true when others might be possible. For instance, in my biology classes, I was taught that insect wings either evolved from gills or from lobes on their exoskeletons. Or maybe there's another option, and a good creator designed them that way, right? So, before we move on to that last step of critical thinking, let's run through a real-life example of how we can separate fact from interpretation in a real textbook example of what's supposed to be overwhelming evidence for evolution. That was the heading under this example in my textbook in first-year biology class. So maybe you've seen a picture like this before. It's showing a human arm, a cat forelimb, a whale flipper, and a bat wing. And you can see the illustrators have nicely mapped out some similarities in those bones. And these similarities are supposed to be overwhelming evidence that all these creatures descended from the same evolutionary ancestor with the same pattern of bones. So let's see if we can separate fact from interpretation here. First we ask, what's the observational science? What are the facts we can see right now? And in this case, the facts that we can see are that we're just looking at bones. We can see there's some similarities in there. That's cool. So we can ask then, what's the historical science? What is the story about the past that we are supposed to believe based on these similarities in the bones? And in this case, the story is, is that once upon a time, there was an evolutionary ancestor with this general pattern of bones. So now millions of years later, all of its descendants have the same pattern. Happy ending, but not necessarily a fact. It's an interpretation with a lot of assumptions behind it. For instance, notice that the textbook has to assume that evolution actually can happen, and in fact did happen. So it's assuming evolution to prove evolution, so there's, there's something going on there. 
And it's also assuming, therefore, that things like mutations can somehow add new genetic information for new body parts like flippers and wings that weren't possible before. It's assuming that Earth is millions of years old to allow this type of evolution to happen, even if it were possible. There's a lot of assumptions there, a lot of problems with those assumptions that you can learn about in our other resources like the Answers books. But meanwhile, let's ask, what is another explanation? So how can we look at these same bone similarities through a biblical pair of glasses? Well, in this case, biblically, it makes a lot of sense to think about these bones as being similar, not because they're from the same ancestor, but because they're from the same designer. And it's a good design that works for a lot of different applications serving similar functions under similar constraints mechanically. We see this in good human engineering too, don't we? For instance, a lot of vehicles have similar looking wheels because mechanically, wheels are a really useful design. If you invent a new type of vehicle, you're not going to um, make a new type of wheel, uh, literally reinvent the wheel to make it a square or something, because mechanically, it just wouldn't work as well. So we expect that a good engineer will apply the same types of good engineering to different units that would benefit from it. And by the way, this actually makes more sense of what we see in the real world than the evolutionary version of the story does. For instance, evolutionists have to look at living things with similarities when they don't think those creatures are closely related, uh, like the eyes and squids in humans that look alike, even though they're not supposed to be close relatives. And then evolutionists have to say that somehow evolution, which doesn't have any intelligence intelligence or foresight managed to arrive at that same good design plan independently multiple times. So eyes, for instance, evolutionists have to say evolved independently like 40 to 60 times when evolving a functional eye even once would be a miracle. So that is just one example of how we can take what is supposed to be overwhelming evidence for evolution, separate fact from interpretation, and find that the facts we do see actually support a biblical worldview even better. All right, at this point you will have caught a lot of the potential fallacies in a message, but there could still be some other lines of flawed logic lurking behind those facts. So that is what you want to do a last check for. So we only have time to look at a few types of flawed logic today. So I'll focus on ones that you see all over the internet. So for instance, we're going to look at inductive proofs, straw man arguments, and faulty analogies. So starting with inductive proofs, uh, this is when someone says that something is proven when you really can't know that for sure. And to understand how this works, we're going to have to look at two different types of reasoning, deduction and induction. And they are a lot more fun than they might sound. So for deductive reasoning, that is when you start with a known big picture of reality and you try to conclude smaller details, smaller facts from that known big picture. So let's say your known big picture is dinosaur. You know what a dinosaur is. Therefore, you can conclusively draw little facts, like we know it's going to have toes and teeth and a tail. If you know what the big picture of a dinosaur looks like, you know those are all parts of that big picture of a dinosaur. So with deduction, you could say something like, all dinosaurs have toes, T-Rexes are dinosaurs, therefore T-Rexes have toes. You're arguing from big picture to little fact. And that's sound logic. But induction goes the other way around. So that's when you start with a few little facts, and then you try to construct a big picture of reality and what you think reality looks like based on those little facts. So it'd be like looking at a few pieces of a puzzle and trying to imagine what the rest of the puzzle looks like. So with inductive reasoning, we might say something like, all dinosaurs have toes, T-Rexes have toes, that's your little fact, therefore T-Rexes are dinosaurs. Now that might sound kind of smooth if you say it really quickly while standing on your head, but the problem is that little facts aren't always enough to lead you to the right big picture. For instance, you could inductively reason that all dinosaurs have toes, kittens have toes, therefore kittens are dinosaurs, <laughs> right? So induction doesn't always work. But something to keep in mind is that the scientific method and basically all human reasoning is built on inductive reasoning. We don't know everything. We don't start with having all knowledge of the big picture reality. So we start by looking at little facts and observations and trying to construct what we think the big picture of reality is. And induction is really useful. The scientific method, uh, when we have a lot of data points, can help us reach reliable conclusions. And yet we can't necessarily prove that conclusion is 100% true because 
because we don't know everything. So, to another, uh, so tomorrow, another little fact could come along that throws off our interpretation and makes us rewrite the story that we thought was true before. So that's why one of the first things I learned in my science classes was to never write the word prove in a lab report, even though we see words like that a lot in the media. So understanding the difference between induction and deduction can not only help us understand when things can't really be proven, but it can also help us identify false teaching. And here's what I mean by that. Proper teaching about the Bible is based on deductive reasoning in the sense that we start with God's word as our big picture for truth. So since the, we know that the whole Bible, the whole big picture of the Bible is true, we know that all the little facts in the Bible, the little individual verses and doctrines it contains, are also true. So starting with the Bible and getting our little ideas from it is the proper way to interpret the Bible, exegesis. But what happens often in false teaching is that someone will start with their own human idea of what they think is the case. Then they try to fit that idea into one or a few little verses in the Bible, maybe by cherry picking them or taking them out of context or misinterpreting them, twisting them a little bit. And then they use that to try to construct a new big picture of what they think the Bible teaches. And that is an improper way of interpreting the Bible, eisegesis. And this is how a lot of false teachings get started. For instance, I've heard people say, well, there's a verse in Mark that says that Jesus went into the house. Therefore, Jesus had a house. Therefore, Jesus was rich. Therefore, God wants you to be rich. Therefore, the gospel is about having a comfortable earthly existence. <laughs> but that's really not what the big picture of the Bible teaches. Eisegesis is also how we get teachings like theistic evolution and trying to write ideas of millions of years, for instance, into the Bible. Uh, when we do not get those out of the Bible and trying to insert them in there actually throws off our interpretation in our later theology. Similarly, if people in the past have tried quoting the Bible to justify wrongdoings, you can be sure they were using eisegesis to do so. All right, so that's inductive proofs. Now let's look at a type of flawed logic called straw man arguments. So straw man arguments try to misrepresent an opposing perspective by twisting it to sound unreasonable and as easy to knock over as a straw man. So all you have to do to respond is by bringing the discussion back to what the attack perspective actually said. So for instance, let's say that one person is singing rather loudly. Person number two could be like, excuse me, could you please sing a little bit quieter? Now that's not an unreasonable request, right? But person one could twist it to sound unreasonable by reframing it with a straw man statement. Like, oh, you think I should never speak again? It's not what I said. You don't appreciate the arts? Also not what I said. You think the whole world should be silent at your request? Also not what I said. So see, for every straw man that person one throws at person two, person two can respond by gently clarifying what was actually said, diffuses the situation. Sometimes those straw men are a little more subtle. So for instance, textbooks might say, well, creationists believe that living things never change, but living things do change, therefore creationists are wrong. But hold on, do most biblical creationists believe that nothing in life ever changes? No, we do see those variations within kinds of living things God created, like those different beak lengths in finches. And that's cool. That's observational science. It supports the biblical creation model. It doesn't tell us how we can get changes from one kind of living thing to another. So we say, way to go, finches. But by claiming that creationists believe that nothing ever changes, the textbook is trying to weaken the biblical perspective to make it sound unreasonable, which is a classic straw man. All right. So the last type of flawed logic we're going to look at are faulty analogies. So analogies are just memorable comparisons between two things. They're great for illustrating abstract concepts. Even Jesus used them all the time to try to compare the kingdom of heaven to, say, a mustard seed or a pearl merchant or yeast. So analogies are great at illustrating, but something to keep in mind uh, but something to keep in mind is that, humanly speaking, analogies can illustrate, but they don't actually prove arguments' conclusions. That's not how they're structured. So if you hear an analogy that seems to attack a biblical view, first of all, you don't have to panic because the Bible will win every time. Second, you don't have to worry because analogies can't prove arguments anyway. And third, you can usually show it is a faulty analogy by looking for an important difference between the things being compared. 
The more important the difference, the weaker the analogy. Then what's kind of fun is if that analogy refers to some sort of concept that's borrowed from a biblical worldview, like truth or logic or knowledge or human value, you can often ask some sort of big picture question which you can use to turn the analogy around to support the Bible by identifying that concept. So that might sound a little complex, but it's really fun, so we'll look at a quick example. For instance, maybe you've heard that old Eastern parable that all religions are like three blindfolded guys feeling the same elephant. So the story goes, the first guy felt the elephant's trunk and said, well, an elephant is a thin, flexible cylinder. Second guy felt the elephant's foot and was like, um, no, it's a thick cylinder. It doesn't move very well. Third guy felt the elephant's ear and was like, you guys are both wrong. An elephant is just kind of a flappy membrane. So the analogy goes, just like these different blindfolded guys were really feeling the same elephant, different religions Religions might seem to disagree, but they're all describing the same God and the same path to heaven, right? Well, no, so let's think about why not. First of all, this fails the very first check of critical thinking, checking scripture. We know it's going to fall apart somehow, so we can identify that this is a faulty analogy by looking for an important difference between the things being compared. So in this case, it's comparing the guys feeling an elephant to different worldview statements. So starting with the elephant, we can see that different body parts can coexist on the same elephant. But let's think about contradictory worldview statements. For instance, as Christians, we affirm that Jesus is God, the Son of God, but people from other worldviews would say he's not. So can Jesus be both God and not God at the same time in the same sense? No, not in the same logical reality. So different body parts can coexist on the same elephant in the same logical reality, but contradictory religious or worldview statements cannot coexist as truth in the same logical reality. That is a big difference between the things being compared, so we've just shown this is a faulty analogy. Now let's see if we can ask a question that identifies some sort of biblical concept that we can use to turn the analogy around to actually support the Bible. For instance, we can think about the concept of truth, and we could ask a question like, hang on, how would anyone talking about these blindfolded guys know the truth that they're really describing the same elephant? Well, they'd have to be the person with open eyes, right? They'd have to somehow be the one who can see the big picture of reality that everyone else is just feeling around to discover. So in the same way as anyone who says all religions are the same, the only person with open eyes or all knowledge to observe the big picture of reality that all the religions are just feeling around to discover, such a person with all knowledge by definition would be God, and God already has revealed the big picture of reality to us through his word. So that is an example of how by bringing messages back to what truth is and where truth comes from, we can point people to God's word and to Jesus who is the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And for that reason, I strongly encourage you to put your faith and hope in Jesus Christ today if you haven't done so already. All right, well, we've plowed through a lot of information, so we'll do a quick recap. We've been looking at three rules of critical thinking. Number one was don't panic when you hear a message that challenges your faith. Instead, we saw how to break that message down with the seven checks of critical thinking we went over. So now we're at the last step, which is following up on remaining questions you have. And this is important because while this system will help you filter all kinds of untruths that might sound really persuasive from all the information you encounter, you might still have some unresolved questions left over. So congratulations, now you can panic. I'm kidding, don't do that. Instead, remember that as Christians, faith crises don't begin when we start asking questions. They begin when we stop seeking answers and give up on truth existing. And three great sources to consult when seeking answers are apologetics resources, biblically grounded mentors, and of course, God himself. Whenever we have questions, we should commit them back to God, remembering that as humans, we won't understand everything, but we can trust that God does know the answer. We can ask him for the answer, but we can trust him even if he doesn't reveal that answer to us this side of eternity. When I'd be stuck with a big question like that in university, I found it helpful to remember Peter's words when Jesus' teachings became so tough that a lot of disciples began walking away from their faith. Jesus asked his 12 followers if they wanted to leave too. But remember what Peter said, 
He said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We've believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. So these words encouraged me in university by reminding me that the weight of certainty for my faith far surpassed the uncertainty of any unresolved questions I might personally have. And by and large, I found that what I did learn from following up on my questions ended up strengthening my faith. So those are the tools I promised I'd share with you. Now let's see if we can go back and apply them to everything the fake professor said in the earlier role play. For instance, remember she said that while religion probably just evolved as this means to help people cope with uncertainties and control populations and so on. Well, if I heard that in a class again, here's what I could do differently. First of all, I wouldn't panic because truth fears no questions. Instead, I would break the message down with those seven checks of critical thinking we went over. So first of all, checking scripture, uh, does this message conflict with the Bible? <laughs> yes, she's basically saying that uh, people created God. We know that's opposite to what's actually true. Uh, it fails a big picture teaching from scripture, so it fails check two, check the challenge, uh, because it contradicts with that big picture uh, teaching from scripture. So moving on then to check the source, uh, this is a credible source telling us this message. It's a professor talking about her field of expertise, but we need to remember what is her worldview? Is she looking at um, this concept through the glasses of man's word or God's word? And that word evolved, again, signals that she thinks people created God, so she's definitely not looking at it through the glasses of God's word. She must be coming from just the perspective of man's word, which is going to impact her assumptions and conclusions, which will be important to remember. Meanwhile, we can ask, are there any keyword definitions we might want to keep in mind here? Well, maybe religion. She's talking as though all religions are the same, which we just saw isn't the case. And she's also not using the word religion in the sense of the fourth definition that the Merriam-Webster Dictionary gives as basically just a big picture belief system, which would include atheism. So by her own thinking, atheism also evolved. But I doubt that she would use that, um, that idea within her worldview to say that therefore atheism is false. So starting to feel a little bit better here. We can ask also, why might this message sound persuasive? That will help us check for propaganda. And in this case, the message might sound persuasive even though it's not true because of factors like that it comes from an authoritative professor and maybe everyone else in the class seems to agree with it. Maybe we've heard it repeated a number of times. Maybe it's presented very eloquently, but none of these things actually tells us whether the message is true. All right, so then we can ask, what are some facts and what are the interpretations? How do we separate those in this message? So to start by identifying the facts, we can look for the parts of the message that reflect things that we can see in the world right now. And in this case, we can see that there are different religions. That's the fact we have to deal with. So the interpretation then is that all of these religions just evolved in these different ways that she's mentioned. There's a flag word that tells us it's an interpretation. That word probably gives us a big clue there. So basically this whole rest of the sentence is just an interpretation of what would have happened in the past based on evolutionary assumptions being true in the first place. So she's starting with evolutionary ideas to be able to assume that all these religions evolved in this different way and then stating it as a fact. When biblically, we would understand that lots of different religions are present because people like to rebel against God's word. And we come up with all kinds of different idols. We would expect, based on what the Bible says, that there would be a lot of different false belief systems. So that's probably where I would cap it in responding to this particular message. But if I did have any questions still about this, um, I could go back and follow up on them by consulting God, Mentors, and Apologetics resources. So that is what I would do in this case. Hopefully that is encouraging to your faith today. And that gives you the tools that helped me think critically about messages that challenged my faith in university. So you can now go and use these tools to answer any new question that you have about messages you encounter that contradict the Bible and think like an apologist yourself.